Um, <laughs> one of the many reasons that, that I deeply respect and actually love Dan is that Dan, as many of you know, Dan was um, at the absolute pinnacle in the traditional media. He was a technology columnist, and, and I would say maybe the most respected technology columnist in the country um, at the San Jose Mercury News. Um, and out of uh, conviction and out of vision and seeing where the world was going and hoping to shape where the world was going to get it to the right place, Dan left that job and leapt into the void um, in order to be able to pursue his interest in citizen media. And so Dan, for me, combines the very best of traditional journalism uh, and uh, with a, a deep respect and understanding of of what's going on now as citizens' media, citizens' journalism begins to emerge and take shape, and insists, and this is the thing that's key for me, he insists on the best from both sides. That uh, He has a sense of journalistic integrity that is unmatched and a sense, set of standards and values that is unwavering. And he brings that to this uh, wild, boiling cauldron of, of um, citizenship. So. Um, He's the author of uh, We the Media, He's, uh, which is the seminal book on this topic. He's um, heading up a new uh, program at Arizona, St Arizona State University, and he's here to talk with us today. Dan. Wow. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, and thank you all for being here. It's great to see colleagues, and uh, including my, especially my lawyer friends, um, at the <laughs> Citizen Media Law Project, <laughs> who are doing wonderful and important work. Um, and all of you, it's, it's great to see so many friendly faces. I'm going to whip through a bunch of stuff that I would normally go uh, an hour or more with, and especially the stuff at the beginning, which is kind of background, and then get to the, this, the newer things that I'm thinking about. And um, that's the agenda. Uh, it won't be quite that much. The just quickly reviewing the media shift that we've gone through from the the uh, cave drawings, the scrolls, Gutenberg Bible. My, my Silicon Valley heritage is in the version numbers I put on everything. Uh, uh, the, the pamphleteers, the uh, Telegraph, uh, Radio 2.0, I think the the mass broadcast TV. Uh, and then where we are now, this kind of amazing transition into uh, everything, everywhere, every time. And the democratizing of media that I've talked about for years, but I, I think it's pretty critical. And I'm going to, this is an impressionistic kind of tour through some of the stuff that's been going on. Uh, I won't talk about any of them in particular now, but just the amazing variety of things that we're doing on and about the web. I just, that was a, uh, that was compressed about 20 minutes worth. And <laughs> <laughs> but I, I, I love the variety that's there and what's happening, and, and we could talk about any of those at uh, great length. I want to talk about two things in today in, in particular, uh, well, really three. Um, I'm, I'm going to make the argument that. Um, we, we're all worried about supply when it comes to journalism, which is to say, uh, as the newspaper industry implodes, as the broadcast news really does the same for the most part or becomes utterly trivial, there's, there's a great deal of angst, mostly on the part, I think, of journalists who see unemployment looming in their future um, or, or underemployment. Uh, it's not... It's, it's not bad that people are worried about that, and I'm worried about much of that, too. But I'm, I've got to say, I'm just not worried about supply anymore the way I was. I think we're really on the, the road toward a good supply. And I want to, uh, first of all, just get past this question of what is, uh, you know, who is the journalist. It's the wrong question. It's what is journalism. So we can call that journalism without anybody disputing it. You know, we can... We can probably agree not journalism and then move on. But the, you know, these cases in between, the random act of journalism by the guy in the London Underground, the uh, uh, Josh Marshall at Talking Points Memo, the blogger who covers the Kenyan parliament better than anybody. Doc Searles, our colleague here at the Berkman Center, says it's an and situation, not or. Not one or the other, it's one and the other and a diversifying ecosystem 
that is, is really quite remarkable. And again, I'm not going to go through things at great length, but uh, talk about things that are, these are all part of this ecosystem, even a trade association doing something that resembles journalism. Human Rights Watch, other NGOs, advocates doing media with better reporting, that is gathering of information than the journalists do in most cases. The best reporting, as in getting information on uh, torture and Guantanamo, has been the, from the American Civil Liberties Union, not from newspapers. Uh, they've done a good job, particularly the New York Times, but it's not been the best. It's been from the ACLU, that famous journalism organization. And the really good news in this, why I'm so sure that supply is going to be solved, is that it's really cheap to try stuff. And Clay Shirky has put it best, I think, that there's no barrier anymore between an idea and just trying it. Just do it. And that the, the process that we're, we're doing at Arizona State is to, to say to students, do something fast. If it fails, uh, do something else and iterate as you go, and it's fine. Don't even worry about it. So you end up with all kinds of things that are out there in, in this world of new journalism and media. By the way, this is a student project that we think is, a, is likely to get funded. This is another student project uh, based on the light rail system in Phoenix that we're quite sure is going to get funded as a real company. A little project we did that took two hours with some phones that have GPS in them uh, showing uh, an event that, that takes place over time and space in Phoenix. Uh, the, the wonderful coverage of the Kenyan elections. Uh, Barry Parr in Half Moon Bay, California, covering his community because the San Francisco Chronicle, the nearest newspaper, won't do it unless something bad happens. ProPublica and other nonprofit things getting into this mix in a very powerful way. The New York Times doing APIs. I have to. My one remaining newspaper uh, stock holding is in the New York Times. It's worth very little, I can tell you, but it's, I should disclose that. Um, and this, this thing that uh, some people are trying to basically create a new aggregator and a paywall, I'm skeptical of it, but I'm glad they're trying. That's the point. There's lots of stuff happening, an enormous amount of things. I'm just pretty sure we're going to get enough journalism. I think there's going to be lots of stuff out there it doesn't solve the quality problem. We're going to come back to that. But it, I, I'm, I'm just not worried anymore about supply. I think we're going to have more than we want in some ways. I'm kind of worried about demand. In fact, I'm really worried about demand, which is to say uh, I'm worried about a culture that we live in that where media looks like that to most of us. And I, I don't think that this is an appropriate uh, way to think of media. It, I don't mind sitting back and watching the sci-fi channel, but I don't think that's the uh, way we should do journalism in particular and community information uh, beyond that. This is, this is something that's a vestige of a mass media era, of, of a time when we like, we, we said, okay, you tell me what's going on and I'll pretend that you know what you're talking about. You'll pretend you know what you're talking about, and I'll pretend that's true. It's, it's, not, it's just not working well, and it's, it's led to a, a lazy culture. And I don't like the fact that we're lazy about our media, because it's part of being lazy about citizenship is being lazy about the media. And I think we have to become more active, and I get back to there's the too much information problem, the, the accuracy problem in a Photoshop world where Images like that race around before people debunk them, and people may still think that's uh, a true thing. And not to mention that you know our big institutions don't get it right all the time, and sometimes with catastrophic consequences, uh, not directly causing a war, but sure as hell helping it happen by bad journalism. We, are, we have to think our way through these. We have an ecosystem in bad need of repair. Uh, and I want to just suggest that this is not alchemy that we're going to need to do it, but something that goes deeper. And a few months ago, I did a uh, part of a, a Berkman Center uh, project report uh, on, called Media Republic that, uh, I'm sorry, Persephone's not here. I wanted to give a shout out to her. But the, the uh, 
Media Republic looked at where we were, and a bunch of us, including I see Tom Stites here and others, did some essays for it. And uh, one that I did was I thought we needed some new principles and and uh, that apply to both consumers, and I put that word in quotes, and journalists alike. And I think that well, basically it's really two aspects. Got to persuade the news consumers to be real active users, like users of media, not just consumers. And of course, never going to change is to persuade journalists of all stripes and all parts of that spectrum to be better at what they're doing. So for the consumers, this is uh, where I'm going with this, and, and I'll get back to it. This is the be skeptical of everything, and the, the everything spans quite a wide variety of things. The, uh, the BBC up there has my favorite business model called pay me or go to jail. Uh, I think that's a hard one to replicate. Uh, but you don't be equally skeptical of everything out there. So I'm, I think we all need to establish in our minds as we use media that kind of a bullshit meter and say, you know, just, just have it working all the time. We have that in our minds in general. We kind of know when someone is trying to scam us, or, but we don't always, but we need to really, really apply it in this world. And I think it's a mistake to think of credibility as starting at zero. I think we have to th consider credibility to have a negative quality, not just a zero quality. And to me, this is a very important thing. So. A, the anonymous comments on the Washington Post stories and any place that are anonymous comments, they don't start with zero credibility in my mind. They kind of start with negative credibility. They'd have to work really hard just to get to no credibility. <laughs> and if I start thinking about it in these ways, I think I end up with a more accurate understanding of what these media forms are doing. And I'm not dismissing random anonymous comments. Uh, sometimes there's something good in there, but it's, it's I, I have to start with a bias, and the bias is that this is negative credibility, and I, I consider that an important notion. And the anonymity in the world, uh, which I think we are uh, making a big mistake if we try to ban it. There's a lot of people out there who say, oh, anonymous speech should not be permitted. Well. Uh, that, would con that would be contrary to many things like the First Amendment in the United States and to our history and to a lot of other things, but it's contrary to all uh, logic. I just, I don't think that it's, uh, it's not a good idea to refuse to stand behind your own words in most cases. In fact, it's a bad idea, but we need to preserve it for the times when we really need it, and I'm worried that we're heading the wrong way. But we have to, I think, in that scale of, of credibility, we have to start as consumers and users. My, my hope is that people will see in a personal anonymous attack or an attack on something. And if it's anonymous, I don't think that the response should be to say, well, um, I'm, I, it has no credibility. I, I don't, it's pro, you know, it, it may not be true. You should say to yourself, that's bullshit. Assume it's false. And we may start to correct this problem. The other way to correct it is just don't read those things or pay, pay, pay no attention at all. <clears throat> then another principle, and, and I'm skating through these awfully fast, uh, but another principle I'm trying to think about here is just do you, you know, ask your own questions. No one of, none of us buys a car based on an advertisement, I hope. And we go further. We use the tools that are, uh, that are available, including conversation, including research, including a lot of things. And it gets to the Wikipedia question, which comes up a lot in the university settings, which is some professors say, don't ever use Wikipedia, it's terrible. And uh, it's, it's framing again the wrong way. I think it's clearly often the best place to start. But it's usually the worst place to stop. And I ran that by Jimmy Wales who said, that's exactly right, so from the source, <laughs> or from one of the sources. It, of course, you don't stop with Wikipedia. Where you go is to that long list of links at the bottom of every decent Wikipedia article that goes to source material and to other things that have some credibility and some 
uh, things beyond it. Having said that, Wikipedia gets better and better and better and better and better, and that by and large it's becoming one of the most valuable sources of information on the planet. Another principle here in the, in the being an active consumer is to uh, go outside your comfort zone and, and, and to do things that challenge your own assumptions. So, and I, I'm indebted to Ethan Zuckerman, who I, uh, who's in New York today, I think, who, who really pushed me hard to include this principle, and I'm really glad he did, because it's, it's a key one. Uh, so I look at global voices to hear from people I would not normally hear from around the world in cultures I would not hear from. Uh, going out of the zone of comfort that I'm uh, most familiar with as, as a white middle class American. That, that, that's a pretty narrow band of the, the uh, world cultural spectrum. I need to get out into those other colors and places. Another thing I try to do is relentlessly attack what I think I believe. And this is an old list I used to keep. I, it, I still do, and sorry it's kind of blurry, but I used to keep a list when I was at the Mercury News, and I don't, I don't update it as often. When I was a columnist, that I had a list of 10 things I believed. And they were not about, they were not about uh, like moral principles, but they were about things like the top one here says, Microsoft is an abusive monopoly that must be restrained in antitrust uh, laws. And uh, now, every six months or so, I would pull this list out, and I would relentlessly attack it. I would do more reporting. I would say, what's changed that makes this not true anymore? Something must have changed. Things don't just stay the same. And if I don't follow the changes, if I don't, if I don't take the core beliefs I have as a columnist on business and technology and relentlessly go after them, I'm going to be wrong in a, in a big public way one of these days, hugely wrong. Now, you know, I'm going to be wrong anyway, but at least this will be one less way to be wrong. Uh, and so every six months or so, I would go after it. I, I, you know, if today I would be really tempted to substitute Google. Uh, not quite yet, but Google is starting to get kind of scary in, in some ways that I think are antitrust worthy. Uh, we should at least, we should at least, uh, I, I better write that down. <laughs> um, I'm not there yet, but I, I no longer feel that Microsoft is number one danger on my list. It's, it's certainly still dangerous, but not, not at that place. So anyway, that, that's just a strategy I personally had, and worked, it worked for me. And then finally using, uh, we, we all need to learn techniques of media. Our kids are great at like creating media with all sorts of devices and tools. Um, not so good, as most of us are not so good, at recognizing how media are used to, to uh, manipulate uh, and, and, and persuade. Maybe it should be persuade and manipulate, which is the extreme case. But we need to be aware of these things. We need to use things like source watch to go past the, the obvious where, uh, and, and news trust uh, uh, Fabrice Florin's experiment, and, and, and lots of tools. This is a, another of my student projects doing a media critic site for Phoenix where Media Critic's a project that's about to launch uh, a national site to, to aggregate media criticism and do some original things uh, that uh, Scott Rosenberg, the former managing editor of Salon, will be editor of. And uh, this is a, a Phoenix version of it. We want to at least ask the right questions. I'm not letting journalists off the hook here, uh, I, though I think that the, again, I think the supply uh, uh, benefits that we're getting from all this innovation will provide us with a lot of good journalism. Again, I, I, I can't say, well, we'll stop there because that won't fix everything. I'm just hoping that journalists of all stripes, but in particular helping the ones who are emerging into this who weren't journalists before, think about the, uh, all of those other principles, but then add the ones of Thoroughness, which is not just doing some homework, but like asking the audience, like Josh Marshall does frequently on Talking Points Memo, and gets great results by asking the readers, what do they know? They know a lot. Uh, and in accuracy, you know, uh, it's not just the fact checker anymore, uh, although, you know, fact checkers are wonderful, but we, we have to 
go past that into other things. Fairness, uh, we're the tools of, of digital technology give us enormous possibilities on the fairness front that were never there before, including something the New York Times did once, uh, I wish they would do it routinely, which is they did a uh, counter point counterpoint with someone who thought he'd been treated very wrongly by the paper. And then the reporter responded to the letter that, that the congressman wrote to the Times. Great idea, but it's a one-off. It's dumb that it's a one-off, but it's still a good thing. Yelp, the uh, company that lets people comment on restaurants and hotels and other things, has finally realized the right thing to do is to give a right of reply to the businesses that are being uh, pilloried by mostly anonymous commenters. Again, the right thing to do, and I ask again, where is the news business writ large, the news people? We should give right of reply in a pretty much routine way, and the digital world makes this easily possible. It's not a hard thing to do. We can do this, and we don't. Independence, again, we have to think a whole way through. So I put this up as an example of non-independence. This is. Uh, and, and it's hard for me to see how they do it, but ProPublica, a wonderful new operation for investigative journalism, is funded in almost entirely by the, uh, the Sandlers, the people who ran a big uh, bank in California that uh, you know, had this, this image of being, oh, above board on everything. Well, that top little thing is one of two mentions I can find of the Sandlers on the ProPublica site. Um, that, that are not about their funding it, uh, with a quick disclaimer and a link to something else, but nowhere do you find on their site something like the Times did, which was a deep investigation of some very squirrely, if not outright unethical behavior by the Sandlers. Now, if ProPublica wants to get the kind of credibility as being independent that I think it should earn, they ought to be doing an investigation of their chief funders, period. Now, I don't expect it to happen any more than I expect a newspaper to do an investigation of the chief advertiser. But independence means more than just not doing, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of parts of that. And then finally, transparency. You know, the transparency, when they mentioned the Sandlers, they're good. They said, okay, there are big funders. But then you get this, this horrific thing going on with TV news where, uh, I don't mean to keep pointing at the Times, it's, I should have find other papers here, but they, they won a Pulitzer yesterday for this and, and another story exposing the, the shabbiest kind of behavior by the uh, TV news industry in putting people on the air who, they, uh, who were not independent uh, commentators in any sense, a, a horrible situation um, that is still unreported by the people who were doing it. And uh, it, it's funny because Brian Williams yesterday does his news broadcast and talks about the Times winning five Pulitzers, including, and he mentioned two, but not that one. <laughs> Gee, I wonder why. I'm, it, it's, it's really appalling, and yet it's standard operating procedure, and I hope over time we can convince people that transparency is partly there for their protection uh, in the end. Yeah, they're going to take some lumps, but at least they're going to be, uh, they, they won't be, they, it, being transparent as a news person doesn't mean that you're going to be believed more. You're probably going to be believed less, but you'll be trusted more. And I think there's a key difference, and we need to think about how we encourage that. The final thing, and then I'll uh, stop, is the new project I'm working on that's related to all of this, which is called Mediactive. And uh, it, it just, uh, it, this is the website which is going live in a, in a day or so. And uh, I'm hoping to do two things here. One is, uh, is to explore all of these principles. I, the, I think the core of it is the principles. Uh, I'm focused more on the, the users uh, as the former consumers. And I'm, what I'm hoping to do here is essentially what it says there, which is to create a user's guide for uh, people in this, this networked era. 
just a, a simple user's guide. The book will be more about principles. The website will be the principles plus the things that change quickly, the tools, the tactics, the techniques, uh, who's doing things. Uh, and I, I'm using it, the second part is to explore what a book is because I don't know what a book is anymore. Uh, but I think that framing it that way where the, a, a, maybe the printed thing is the stuff that doesn't change fast and the, the digital thing, the online thing, is the stuff that does, that feels right to me. I'm going to play with it. I'm going to do the entire thing in public uh, as the last one under Creative Commons. And uh, anyone who follows the blog as I go through this will not need an, in any way to buy the book. But it's, a, uh, it's an experiment that I hope will work. But it's really where I want to focus a lot of my time in the next several years because I think this is an important uh, shift that we have to try and convince people to do uh, at, at many different levels and places. So let me stop and uh, hear your thoughts and uh, that's, uh, that's my plea for your help in this project which I uh, hope some of you will agree to do. Thank you. Yes. Um, well, I guess I, I've got a question and then a, a very short comment or suggestion. The question is, in your in your bullshit meter, I noticed that you had media organizations, basically, or types of media plotted across it, and I wonder whether the unit for a sort of trust system would really be the media uh, form or the media organization, or whether it might better be split among, you know, say we can trust some New York Times reporters better than others. Uh, I, and that I had several lines uh, going off the media organizations, one that was going quite low on the scale and one that was going quite high. Okay, maybe, to, I, maybe I just didn't to, see that. I, I probably didn't make that clear enough. No. I. There are reporters at the New York Times whose work I would start in that 30 to minus 30 scale. I would start them at like a 27 positive. <laughs> and there are others. Uh, I don't know if there's anyone I would ever give a 30 in that, in, on that meter. I just because we all make mistakes. But uh, there are some New York Times reporters. Uh, uh, fewer now because they the the really bad ones seem to be have gone. But um, there's still bad stuff in the Times, and it's, and it's not even a reporter as much as a story. Uh, even, even the reporters who, who do egregious things sometimes get it right. Uh, it, it's a, I don't know how to measure this. We're going to be spending years in the world figuring that out. And is there ever an opportunity for people who can code to work on helping de uh, develop systems that combine popularity and reputation, and reputation being an incredibly complicated word. And when we do that, I think we'll get something pretty valuable that, that will uh, help along this path. Yeah, you had a comment. You um, yeah, just the, the little suggestion. It, it struck me when you were talking about these principles, especially for journalists, that uh, much of what you have there is sort of a an updated version of what we see in the Society for Professional Journalists Code of Ethics. It's, there's, um, you know, it starts with seek truth and report it, and it, that, that gets to some of the thoroughness and, um, you know, act independently, be accountable, and these principles there. And I just, I pulled it up, and it turns out that nobody's updated that thing since 1996. So it seems like <laughs> that might be a framework in which <laughs> you could sort of offer these um, it, principles. They, uh, the, the uh, there are a number of uh, ethics policies and principles and things out there among journalists, uh, none of which are followed um, to a T. Um, the, one of my big beefs with the New York Times and the Washington Post and the others is how routinely they violate their own standards uh, and, and make no apology for it. I, I, you know, if you're going to have standards, at least uphold them. But I see these all as goals. You'll notice the word uh, objectivity appeared nowhere in this presentation. Yeah. I'm worried about money in, this, in the ecosystem that we seem to be moving into because 
when you combine money with the possibility for lack of transparency or some kind of fake identity or anonymity, I think it's I think it's scary because people sites or individuals who can appear to be citizen journalists can really be backed by one or another interest, usually with money. <clears throat> the slash, the other side of the money part, is the lack of money and resources. <clears throat> um, somebody who has to have a job uh, can't actually afford to be necessarily, you know, or contribute as much to, say, citizen efforts, whether it's a community radio or an online site. So what is your take on, on that whole aspect of the land that we're kind of sliding into? Uh, it's, my take is it's going to be messy and difficult, but that we'll have more good things than we had in the past. Maybe not on the, focused on the specific things we want them to be focused on at all times. Uh, the, the money used to uh, manipulate as opposed to inform has not, that's not a new problem. Uh, and even, uh, even you know, there, this has been out there for some time. We, we need more, again, we need more uh, eyes on everything to see that when we do find something that's being used to manipulate that we hear about it. Uh, again, there's good opportunity for tool makers of various kinds to think about how we would uh, start tagging things and, and thinking that through. Uh, but relentless media criticism is is probably the best sunlight on it that we're going to get. I don't know how, if it'll be enough. Uh, as far as the inability to to be part of it, uh, there are going to be varying scales. The person, you know, which is like most of us who has, you know, most people can't do this all day. They have a life, and 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 family and and responsibilities, but it doesn't take, it. There, there are two possibilities. One is that we have lots and lots and lots of people doing occasional acts that fit into journalism and finding ways to uh, be coherent about that. Uh, we, need, we need to do things to help people who see something newsworthy to know what to do next. Uh, I think that's getting kind of ingrained in the culture, not in the, always the best ways, but uh, people are now aware that if they see something newsworthy and they're with, there with a phone with a camera in it, they should get it. Um, what they do next is an important question. Not everyone, I think, is fully uh, cognizant of what their own rights are and, and maybe responsibilities. And, and there's a great opportunity to tell the world, here's. Uh, what you do next, and I think what you do next is not necessarily to send it to YouTube. Though that may be, if you make an informed decision, that might be the right thing, but not always. So all kinds of possibilities there, and it, it does create a whole new opportunity space for the, the people who um, have been put down as aggregators, who become editors of a fashion in ways that uh, we've not had in the past in precisely that way, but uh, the wire editor of any newspaper 30 years ago was doing an aggregator function, seeing all the stuff that was flowing in on the wires and picking the good stuff. Uh, we, there's just so much more good stuff and vastly more bad stuff. Uh, this complicates the, the new wire editing, as it were, but I think we can work toward something and the communities will help each other find out what's important to the community and to the individuals within that who, who can, uh, over time, make their own needs better known to the community in a, in a kind of generic way. It doesn't, I don't think this solves everything, but it's possible. Um, I'm visiting here with my daughter and I'm with the West Coast University. Mm -hmm. And I was taking notes because we have a, a required module that all students must take before graduation called information literacy. And your principles were excellent that we'll embed in our next version of that. It's an online thing they go through to, to be more discriminating. And the students now can just go to Google and pull it up. What university? San Francisco State University. 
and um, I'm the CIO there. And what I'm asking is, after you gave your list of principles, you then went to some things for journalists. And I'm wondering, do you have any advice for students that are entering this world as you know, 18 year olds coming into colleges across the country? And I work with the whole CSU system on this. And so we're talking about over 450,000 students. And we're all trying to orient them toward being more discriminating because mm -hmm. they've grown up in a world that's different than the one we grew up in. And so I'm interested in any thoughts you have for how to orient them into this world. Just uh, like you had for journalists, as the receivers. Well, I, I think that was embodied in the, the turning the consumer, uh, passive consumer, into an active participant. Yeah, in, in that, that set of principles uh, and understanding that there's, there's no clear dividing line between them and the people creating media in, in this world. Uh, I didn't mean there to be a suggestion that all, you, know, you flip a switch at some point and then become part of the journalism. It's not that way at all and I, I obviously need a better slide deck for that. But um, I'm, I wonder if it's too late to do it in college. If we don't have people growing up who are skeptical by definition, by nature, of, of things, if we, don't, if we don't teach children in grade school and high school to, uh, to be uh, critical thinkers, maybe too late by college. Although going to college seems to you know, liberate people in some ways that, that that's probably true now as it was in our college days. But I, uh, I, think that you, I think schools at all levels are great leverage points for this to happen. Uh, universities are more likely to do it. I, the problem with trying to get people in grade schools to think about this is that to teach critical thinking to children in half the grade schools in this country would get you Yeah. Just following up on this, because I've thought about this a lot, too, and I agree that we probably need to start it earlier, but since I'm at a university, too, I've been thinking about it partly as a university-level intervention, and even there, I'm not, it's not clear that even at the university, so you say at SFSU you have this, it's required of all the students, you said, I just looked it up, so it's a, it's an online course, is it? Oasis. Right, and so... I see it's required by the end of the second semester, and what well, happens if some... don't all take it, so we, you really enforce it before you graduate. You know, okay, students. so so I guess it's a graduation requirement. I guess part of the... I mean, it's supposed to be at the end of the second semester. Right, right. I'm just wondering that even if we agreed, which people still, I mean, we're not at that point, but if we got to the point of agreeing that this is something we need, we need to institute it, it's really not clear at all whose jurisdiction it falls under. And is it, you know, is it the CIO? Is it some? Is it the library? Is it some department? And so even at that level, I don't think we have the answers. And then I think it's even more complicated if you take it down the educational. It, it's level. yeah. And there's one university I'm aware of that has a course uh, devoted to this, required of all freshmen, and that's uh, uh, State Brook. University of New York at Stony Brook. UMass also does College of Public and Community. Okay. Required media literacy. Um, and, and uh, but that's a different set of things. That it's, a, it's a, it's uh, a. Well, these are related, but the. It's uh, culturally. I mean, it's I remember. Political. I remember some English courses that taught critical thinking. So I don't. I don't yeah. know. <laughs> it's not like this is going to be the purview of just one. Uh, you know, read, read Plato, and you get some pretty good critical thinking <laughs> skills. It's a, but. Um, the the how, uh, Howie Schneider at, at State University of New York at Stony Brook has a program called in news literacy is what they're calling it that is actually specifically about this kind of thing although uh, it I don't have I, I like what they're doing a lot and I think it ought to spread widely I wouldn't do it exactly the way they do but but this is if if we can just have the argument over how to do it then I'll be really thrilled. I think the best media criticism right now is on Comedy Central. 
<laughs> and I think they have those teams of people every day going through all the cable news and all the print news and finding the juicy parts and showing very clearly to a huge, relatively speaking, audience what's wrong with most mainstream news. I don't think it has to be humor. But I think it's happening in Comedy Central because they don't bother to ask those political questions we're asking today, which is, it's not really that it's so hard. It's where's the political will? Where are the institutions to do this? If the mainstream media itself is the machine that's going to be criticized, where other than some kind of decentralized network of more and less trusting or trustworthy groups can you do that? And it's only that Comedy Central, you know, there's this niche that they call it comedy. So it's like The Simpsons on Fox. You know, Murdoch doesn't care because as long as people are laughing, he's happy. I do think right now that is the place to be. I think that if you can spoof or mock so much of really bad mainstream journalism, that's one way. But that could be shut down any time. And I think we need to find other ways to build that political will to do this work. I, um, just two quick responses. I, I think that the comedy... Uh, Central, uh, The Daily Show has some of the best criticism of uh, television news, big television news that I've seen. But that's a very narrow part of, of journalism in, in terms of its content. It happens to be a big impact because of their audience size. but. Uh, and they also have, as, as you noted, a large staff of people who are going through these clips. Um, and we need better ways to do that, incidentally, too, because it's, uh, there are copyright issues that are causing some real problems here. The other is that, I mean, if you want to see really bad television journalism, just turn on the local news in any city in America at 5 o'clock. And, and you'll see the worst uh, journalism uh, You'll ever, you'll ever find. But the other thing is that we're, we have to be critiquing each other as bloggers and others who are part of this new ecosystem. We're, we're, we cannot let each other off the hook and by just saying, well, it's these big guys. We have to be going after the things we do. The thing about blogs that I think is important is there's a level of transparency and a feedback typically right under the posting that does not exist in traditional media except rarely. So we have, we have this is broader and more potential in the end. Uh, Lisa, 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 yeah. So, it is local TV news, but uh, sometime this year, one of the top 50 in population cities in the United States will wake up and there will be no daily newspaper. What happens next? What do you think will happen next? I have an idea of what I think will happen. Um, what, what happens next week? That's a, I, I challenge your assumption. Um, that there will be no daily newspaper in any of the top 50 cities in, in, in this country. There won't, I, I take for granted there will be no, that the current uh, dominant daily newspaper in some of those cities will be out of business within a couple of years or have its, have its uh, uh, or have been through a bankruptcy that basically resets the debt to zero. But there's still a business to be had in print journalism for some period of time, and I'm, this is not this is not going to last forever. But the, the largest problem, the reason that most of these guys are, are facing doom, is that they have so much debt they can't pay it. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, there's an but, element of the subprime so, mortgage crisis. So if the Boston Globe disappears tomorrow, mm -hmm. within two weeks there will be other daily newspapers uh, around that are better than the Metro. Well, we we already uh, have. Oh, and, and, and the Herald. And, and I'm saying if, if there, this is actually a two newspaper town, which is English, but they won't go away completely. There won't, I mean, pub printed newspapers are not going to just vanish. They won't be as uh, comprehensive, which is kind of a weird word to use now, given how, uh, how much they're shrinking their missions anyway. And, uh, you know, if it goes a lot further, who's going to notice? Uh, it, it's a, and I don't mean to be cruel, but there will be a, a huge uh, outpouring of people who say, wow, this is a, the best opportunity in years to do something. Uh, 
uh, to get an audience and to, I hope, to have feedback with that audience and do things. I, do I know exactly what this will look like? No. But I'm, no, there will be no lack of information available, though there will be, uh, it'll be harder to find the things to trust a little bit. Uh, but there will be more things to find. Tom Stites is working on a project that I hope gets traction uh, and, and it will have a pilot in the Boston area, I hope, soon. Uh, there, I, I'm not going to, the word messy, which uh, Weinberger here has made a part of a career on in a sense, by help, he's, he's convinced me that messy is not something to fear but to to actually uh, embrace and, and recognizing that it's got problems associated with it. So going back to the credibility scale, how did you judge that some organizations should move past zero? If I'm assuming Talking Points Memo started out at negative something, um, how did they get up to towards the end of the scale? In, uh, so Talking Points Memo, uh, from the day it started was published by someone who used his own name, who put his own background up there on the site for you to judge by, who had actually done some journalism in the past. So he didn't start below zero. He started at a, you know, in positive territory because, first of all, he used his own name. He stood by, he stood behind his words. That's, that starts you in a really good place for my credibility scale. You have, you have to actually do things that harm your credibility to get down to zero at that point. And then over time, because of the quality he and his team have shown, and their, their, the way they listen to their audience and, and use this feedback system in, in a really brilliant way, it just, it's just going up. I, I, I don't have a, uh, you know, a TikTok that shows how it's gotten there, but it's, it's gone up over time because of the work they do. And I, so, so this is, I think, going to be the way it works in general. We're going to assign arbitrarily in our own minds a place, and then we'll, that, it'll move uh, based on how we use it. Is there a way that, I mean, I can see that from different people's perspective, different organizations or people could have a different spot on the credibility scale. And I'm wondering if there's a, are we going to get to a point where we can all agree that some outlet has uh, you know, X level of credibility. For example, a lot of people think Fox News and Rush Limbaugh have a ton of credibility for some of the reasons you say. I mean, Rush Limbaugh uses his name. I don't know if he's ever done journalism in the past, but you could come up with a list of criteria that or whatever, you know if, well, if you could well, fly. If, if, but no, but my criteria, that. my criteria for for being high on that scale include being, uh, uh, you know, saying things that are actually true. And 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 not, you know, it. Even if most of what you say is true, and you lie strategically to create an overall wrong impression of of the world, that takes you below zero in my in my view. And I and I'm uh, so. And I, I in general, I think I, I don't have anything against Fox existing. I just I just despise the slogan "fair and balanced" because it's a lie. And it. I'm, I'm glad they're around, but I, I, I wish they would just tell the truth. It would be nice. And, the, and, to, and to, to be transparent about who they are and what they do, we have absolutely room for, for that uh, media organization in that ecosystem. My objection to Fox is largely that they're just not honorable about who they are and what they do. Other than that, it's, but I'm, so, I, but I don't think we'll ever all agree on anything, which is a good thing. Uh, and part of this reputation systems thing that I, that I think we're going to need is, it's, that's why I said complicated, because it's horrendously complicated. But I don't want to only know, I, so, so here's a number of variables here. I want to know what people who, people who think broadly as I do about the world. I'd like to know what they think are the most credible sources. Um, and, but, but dismantle that a little bit by not just opinion but by their by by the, how how much they 
go for the truth. And there's a place where even left and right can agree on, on some level of truth. And uh, I want to know what people who don't think the way I do think is important and incredible because I want to be sure to look at that too. A place where you can't really fully trust everything you read. How do you avoid people moving from lazy passive consumer to ultra cynical <coughs> consumer where you kind of get back to the place you started where no one really cares because they can't really if, if I can't believe one article I read in the New York Times how do I know I can read I can trust any of it um, because I don't think trust is binary um, I, I don't think you trust I, I don't think my trust level for the times is in a sense also on a scale I by and large trust a couple of things one is they do a lot of work in reporting they do a lot of work in, in editing and, th and thinking about what they've done and they try to get it right and they usually correct it when it's wrong and they do things that make me furious at the same time but on balance there's this, you know, I have, there's my meter for them, which is up here. It doesn't mean that I believe them all the time. And it, it means particularly that if there's some, if, if I'm going to make some decision uh, core to my life in some way about some big topic or, so, or some personal thing I'm going to do, I'm not going to do it based solely on what they say. I'm going to go a little further. and. and I just, I prefer a world of, of this very uncomfortable uh, <coughs> nuance and uncertainty to one where we are, uh, to, to, to the one where we just say, okay, uh, it, because Uncle Walter says that's the news, that must be the news. Uh, I, I, part of our citizenship seems to me to be to take responsibility or what we know and and what we learn yeah where is the right place to um, teach people not to believe anonymous stuff because the 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 the, this, the technology is clearly enhanced the yeah. ease of anonymous publishing and it's quite remarkable the, the stuff that I get yeah. circulated from members of this community you know, who are the last people, I should think, who would be passing around completely anonymous reports about what really happened in, you know, in the uh, Gulf of Aden or whatever. Uh, uh, so, um, I've often thought that the best single thing we could do to have better journalism would be to have all journalists be covered by some other journalist, to have journalism done to them. Um, because it sure as hell made me better. Because because before journalism, I did something where I got covered a lot, and and it's it's eye opening. Um, I don't think it's I, unfortunately I, I I don't think getting your I don't think getting burned is is you know in a, in a, in a in a in a smart world being burned would not be the way you learn, but for some period of time, a lot of people are just going to have to get burned by having believed something anonymous before they start recognizing and, and telling their friends. The, mm -hmm. I don't I don't it's like what like I just said. It's not like a very effective kind no, of incentive it's, system. It's it's and meanwhile we work hard on trying to teach people that there are consequences to believing things that are that are wrong. And the, or that are unsourced and that and that are that are uh, that are simply intended to damage. Uh, I I don't have a perfect answer by any stretch for this, but I, I, I don't uh, need to be perfect. I uh, just want any kind of answer. Well, <laughs> I, I think this is I think this is going to take a generation yeah. before we're going to be able to have a, a society that, in general, understands that uh, that anonymous. Speech, while valuable, um, it doesn't deserve your trust out the door. In fact, deserves quite the opposite. Yeah. I had uh, two questions. Um, uh, one was about the demise of uh, 
newspapers, whether, you know, city papers of record or maybe even, you know, the New York Times is the East Coast or national paper of record or something. Even if there are plenty of other sources to get information, I think people are going to miss them because of their some type of unifying force that they play where, you know, everyone saw that or everyone read that, some, some common ground. Um, is that something, the first question is, is that something that necessarily is even a legitimate or a necessary function for journalism or can something else, some type of chat groups or something take that uh, space and is that not even necessary for journalism? And second question is just, um, are you prepared to completely let uh, objectivity go? Um, um, I'll answer the second one first. The uh, objectivity is a nice ideal uh, that's hopelessly uh, uh, impractical and that those principles that I outlined I think add up to something better. Uh, so I, that, that, that's just the way I'm going with it. I, I, I don't mind, ob objectivity is a nice idea. Uh, but, and, and I still want to preserve, I hope we will have reporting where it's very difficult to tell, if not impossible, what the reporter thinks about the topic at hand and has done a huge amount of research. But uh, I think in general we're better served by, uh, by reporting that acknowledges worldviews going in where you understand the, the sort of worldview of the person in the organization um, as part of your parsing of how, how they're doing it. So my, my example is when I go to London, I buy the Telegraph for the kind of worldview of the uh, moderate right wing and the Guardian for the view of the moderate left wing and, and figure that I'm kind of triangulating on reality and that that's, that's better than a single thing, and no one should do and should ever read, listen to, watch one media source because that's a guarantee that you'll be uninformed. That guarantees it. Uh, on the first one, I'm no, I'm not happy about this this kind of dissolution of things that gave us some common ground and some common um, at least common agendas. But I. I see all these self-organized things happening that create over time a kind of recognition of something happening. This, that, uh, <coughs> uh, that amazing uh, video of the woman from the UK singing in the contest is, you know, before, we're, before it's over, everyone will have heard that. Um, I find that, you know, that's, maybe that's not, it's not news, but I find that somewhat reassuring. Um, and I think that the really important stuff uh, that, that and, and again, let, let me come back a little bit on this to explain. The, the things that are happening right now of supreme importance, and I don't mean the car chase of the moment in Los Angeles, but the really big stuff, we're going to have live. We're going to get it live. We're going to, because it's obviously going to be that important. We'll get some view of it live. The, the things that are important as topics that we that take understanding and, and thinking about and and, and and work. It's not that it's we have a better chance of getting it, figuring it out over time because on the web, as opposed to the manufacturing uh, era of journalism, when it was manufactured and put in trucks and sent out and it was done. That's it. Now, and we don't know, hardly anyone does it. Actually, the, the best example of this is Wikipedia of all places. The news, the information, the knowledge, the understanding accretes over time to a place where there's much more clarity about something that was just a big story but we didn't know what it really meant. And if the bigger and more important that is, the more likely people will have gotten to see uh, some of this or all of it. I, I again, I, I, I'm not happy about the idea that, uh, and I don't believe, by the way, I do not buy the echo chamber uh, notion that we will only go to the things we believe in. I, I, I just don't believe that. I think that's easier to do in the air, in the era of, of broadcasting. But Fox News doesn't have hyperlinks. 
uh, in the TV version, but and, and not, actually they don't do much of that with their website. But the right wing bloggers I respect, and there are a lot of them, uh, <coughs> put lots of links in their stuff to the things they vehemently despise. Right to those things, and I think that is the uh, mo that that's an underappreciated value of of what we have and where we're going. Um, well, I'm sort of skeptical <laughs> about uh, one theme of what you've been talking about. Uh, this Only one? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, in fact, one. <laughs> I like the, the, the rest pretty much. Uh, it's the lazy user thing. Don't you think it's just a cons consequence of the division of labor in a society, I mean, you know, these lazy people are not that lazy. I mean, they are hard working, hard working, and that's the point. After hours, they just want to relax, right, and get entertained. My favorite, uh, and it also reminds me the or resembles the um, culture discussion, high culture, and you know, like folk culture. Uh, my favorite uh, director uh, is Kieślowski. He's Polish, like me. But, and you know, that like his movies touch upon, you know, very deeply moral human issues, but um, it's, um, it's sort of fringe phenomenon. You have to be in a good mood, you have to be well educated, and so on to really enjoy it. So, don't you think that, uh, and don't you think that the civic uh, journalism? And what you've been talking about is like trying to ask the average people, all of the people, to watch movies, Kishlovsky's movies, instead of really relax after hard working. I, I can see I have to um, do some photoshopping of that particular slide. Um, and, and you're right. Uh, I do not at all denigrate kicking back and watching. Uh, TV and being entertained and and just you know m emptying your mind into the tube as opposed to getting something. What that picture should, what that TV screen should show instead is a news broadcast, which I think is, I I believe it's a it's it's not lazy to want to sit back and be entertained after a long day of work at all. I'm not claiming it is. But I think it's lazy to sit back and watch a news show as if that's giving you all the information you need about things on which you're going to make some key decisions in your life. I think that's a laziness we have, we have accepted um, and, and embraced, partly because we don't have as much time as we would like, which is not a bad reason. Um, but 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 the, on things that matter to us, um, and and things ought to matter more than they do in, in many ways. The uh, I think there's a a civic obligation to to learn more and to to at least have some responsibility for for finding out uh, uh, more than we seem to know today. And it's I don't want to come off as some kind of you know. Uh, someone's great aunt scolding the world because that's the way it sounds I know and I'm trying to find I, I know I need a better way to put this but I do I do think that the era of mass media news has encouraged a uh, an, an intellectual uh, and, and civic laziness in our culture that is dangerous and that that if we don't do something about collectively, that we're going to be in even more trouble than we are today. So, I'm. I, I guess I'm. I am saying very, very much that we start. We need to all take more responsibility for knowing what we know, and and for uh, being part of of that world. I I don't have a better way to put it. Yeah. One last question. Somebody who hasn't asked already. Um, to follow up, uh, staying away from the image, just just the idea that the Dan has a concern 
about the the demand side not being strong enough. Uh, I have heard, you know, practical applications of media tr uh, wisdom being in, imbued in at San Francisco State and the Jim Clearfeld and in uh, or, uh, University of San Francisco, I'm San sorry, Francisco San Francisco State, and Stony Brook and, and, and UMass and other places. But if even if it were installed in, in, in every university in the United States, there would still be uh, two-thirds of the people uh, who don't go to universities would not get a shot at this. So do you have or have you seen anyone working on practical applications of bringing this kind of wisdom to people other than at the university level. Oh yeah, there's lots of work going on in, in what people have been calling media literacy for a long time yeah. uh, at, at all levels of education. Um, I, I, I avoid the expression media literacy right. uh, at all costs because I, I, th I think it works better than Ambien to put people to sleep. Um, but this is, you know, the answer that no one wants is that this is going to start with parents or it's not going to happen. Um, and uh, I think it's going to be a long and hard path to get it into the, you know, universally into schools where it belongs at a much younger age. Uh, partly because we have a consumer culture that, that maybe there's going to be some pushback on that now that we've seen the the limits of that. Uh, I don't know. But there are many leverage points. I'm, I'm, I, I have to say I'm really disappointed that the one of the uh, institutions that should have made this a core mission over the years uh, is the journalism business, and they utterly didn't do it, which is weird because it would have actually given them a much better reason for existing. Than they have today, uh, but you know, it, maybe the in media journalism institutions of the future will take this on as a core mission. But it doesn't have to be just them. The literacy about many things should be part of many things. If uh, I mean, if we could get if we could get eBay to put up a little educational module on um, how business works. Um, for people who who don't understand that, if we could get all kind, you know, all kinds of places to think about having some role in this, that would be cool. But it's it's going to just be persuasion. It's 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 going to take a lot longer than probably my career is going to be at this point. Thank you very much, Daniel. Thanks. For